Are you trying to establish your brand as a thought leader? Start a podcast, invite industry experts to be guests on your show, and watch your brand become the prime resource for decision makers in your industry. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. Logan with Sweetfish here. Before we get straight into today's interview, I wanted to let you know about another podcast you might enjoy. If you're a regular listener of this show, you'll probably really like the B2B revenue executive experience with Chad Sanderson over at Value Selling Associates. Chad is a good friend of ours here at Sweetfish, a phenomenal podcast host. I really liked one of his older episodes from probably a year back with Todd Capone, the author of The Transparency Sale. Great conversation about leveraging honesty, transparency, and a value-added approach in B2B sales. Check out the B2B Revenue Executive Experience with Chad Sanderson on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you do your listening. All right, now let's really get into the show. Welcome back to B2B Growth. I'm Logan Lyles with Sweetfish Media. I'm joined today by Garrett Justice. He is the head of marketing over at Lucid Press. Garrett, how's it going today, man? Hey, it's going really good. Glad to be with you. Thanks, Logan. I love it, man. I love to talk with folks uh, here in the Rocky Mountain tech corridor that's booming uh, these days in Utah and Colorado. How's the weather out in Utah today, man? A little, a little bit rainy today, but you know it could be worse. So we're yeah, gonna, okay. awesome, man. Well, we're going to be talking about ways to capitalize on improved ROI through better design and brand consistency. But before we do that, Garrett, I would love for you to give listeners a little bit of background on yourself and what you and the team at Lucid are up to these days, man. Yeah, sounds good. So Lucid Press is the second product of Lucid Software. So many of your B two B listeners are probably familiar with our sister product, Lucid Chart. It's a web-based diagramming and data visualization platform. So Lucid Press uses a lot of the same underlying technology as Lucid Chart, but it's, it's a pretty different product. So Lucid Press is really what we call a brand templating platform. It's really about empowering organizations to set up libraries of lockable templates for all of the sales or marketing collateral or design pieces that people might need to create. And through the lockable templates, the nice thing about that is people, even those without a design background, can go in and customize the templates to create things like ebooks or social media graphics or sales one pagers or presentations, you kind of name it, without having to go to the central marketing or design team. So it helps alleviate some of that, uh, that, that backlog of small requests that a central marketing or design team gets, and it helps people get create really great content even quicker and get it out there. That's awesome, man. I I love the way that you guys are expanding on the tool set, taking some of the technology uh, that's been applied to solve uh, certain problems. You know, the visualization tool that you guys are now applying to to help salespeople look at organization charts, kind of layering on top of some of the other ways that people have used Lucid Chart in the past, and now uh, taking some of those underlying things and and helping uh, marketers in this way. I you know. This idea of brand consistency, design consistency is something that we've talked about here internally at Sweetfish. And I'm excited to hear from you a little bit about why it's important. I know you guys have done some research on this topic uh, here recently and some steps that marketers can take. But I think in this conversation, anytime you talk about brand and design, we kind of need to just take a second and unpack those terms. Would you mind doing that from your guys' perspective real quick, Garrett? Yeah, for sure. I mean, those are big terms that are pretty loaded and they mean lots of things to lots of people. So, you know, today, as I, as I kind of speak about design and brand, there's a few different types of design. And this is 
for, for those of you who are designers, I'm, I'm not a designer by trade. So this might be an oversimplification for any listeners who might have a design background, but there's a few different types of core design, especially when it comes to, you know, B to the B2B world. There's product and service design. That's like the core product or service that you create whether it's a physical or a digital product or services attached with that. And a lot of times people talk about the design of that. It can be the UX of it. It's a web-based product or you know, the physical design of it. And, and often when people speak about design, that's what they think about. Another part of design, though, is really about graphic design or the web design. And that's really impacting all the other supporting interactions that are outside of the core product or service. So, we, when we talk about design, I think we often talk about the first, the product and the service design, but we forget about all the marketing and sales materials. And that's actually where the sheer volume of interactions are that customers have with design that your company is creating. So uh, I think it's interesting to kind of delineate between the two of those. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. There was a quote I saw um, in a deck that you guys put out and it was this, marketing is the truth of you translated into the language of your customers. And it kind of called out that, you know, brand uh, equals that truth of you and design is the language. And so the language that whatever it is, your product or service or the information about your product, your service, the, the message is how it gets translated. I thought that was really interesting, man. Yeah. And it kind of builds, you know, speaking to that branding piece, you know, the truth of you kind of builds on, there's a famous Jeff Bezos quote where he says, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Uh, and I, I like that because it's really like getting at, it's the truth about who you are. It's not just, you know, who you want to be or who you say you are. It's like the truth of who you really are. And that's definitely true when it comes to, you know, branding. It starts with who you are as a company, what you do and why you do it. And then oftentimes when we think about branding, we think about, you know, the logo and the colors and everything else. And that's just the visual expression of who you are as a company at your core, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. So as we talked about earlier, we're going to get into some steps you can take for better uh, brand and design consistency and why those lead to better ROI. But before we get into what steps you should take, I think we should take a second to talk about the why. There are some factors in the world right now in the markets that that we serve that are affecting uh, this correlation between uh, better design, more consistent branding, and higher ROI. And the first one of those is that the world has come to expect great design everywhere, right? Yeah. And I think that's definitely true. And you know, a quick example of that that I find pretty interesting is um, anyone who's familiar with the Webby Awards, have you seen the Webby Awards? It's a site out there that kind of rates some of the best you know, web pages, and they've expanded since then every year. So they started in 1997 with just you know the best homepage. It's really interesting. I've looked at you know, some of those archives of, you know, the best homepage from 1997, you compare that to, you know, the best homepage that they've scored of today. And it's just, you know, the, it's just drastic, the change. And you can pull anyone off the street, regardless of whether they have, you know, a design background or not, ask them which, which of these is better design. And everyone picks, you know, the more recent one. And that's not just the nature of, you know, the changing trends in web design that exists across, again, everything that your company is designing, that the world has just come to expect great design, not even just the core product or service, but all of those other touch points, which is often, you know, marketing and sales touch points along the way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, man. I, I definitely want to make sure we link to that in the show notes because I think that that's just, I haven't been to that site to look at those rankings, but I think it would be really interesting to look at, okay, what won best homepage in 1997 versus, you know, 2018? Uh, there are going to be some stark differences. Part of it is, you know, the technology, but uh, also just everything about the way things have progressed over the last 20 or so years makes better design easier and therefore or, you know, kind of the bar is higher. The other factor that's contributing to this is something we talk about a lot here at Sweetfish and we're, uh, we encourage a lot is that more people within your organization and essentially everybody should be a content creator of some form or fashion. So can you speak to that reality a little bit too, Garrett, internally and how that affects the importance of design consistency? Yeah, for sure. So again, anyone who's been who's familiar with the Netflix series Mad Men, you know, kind of the 1960s advertising age. This is definitely an oversimplification, but you know, really in the Mad Men age of the 60s, 
marketing was really a strategic marketer or advertiser doing mass marketing to a mass audience. And today, if you think about it, it's completely different. Everyone across your company, salespeople, employees, maybe even vendors or partners are creating, quote, marketing, right, unquote, so some, some type of content um, with your brand on it for increasingly fragmented audiences and a variety of channels and mediums. And it, and it creates some challenges for most organizations to having something be very consistent. And so you have a combination of the world expecting great design and all of these people across your company who aren't trained as designers now creating stuff. And, it, and there's some big challenges for, for many companies when it comes to how do you then be consistent, right? Yeah, absolutely. So that is a great segue. I think that you have teed us up really well, Garrett, to to talk about these three ways that you can improve your design consistency, why it's important, you know, kind of what you said said there echoes uh, the Jeff Bezos quote that you mentioned earlier that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. Uh, because of all these things that are affecting it, it reminds me of something I heard Seth Godin say. I'm not. I'm probably not going to be able to quote him specifically, but uh, you know, everything is marketing. And so everything that's going out, every interaction, every piece of collateral, every piece of messaging, every design element is marketing, whether it's created by marketing or not, you know, which fits in line with what you were saying about everyone being a content creator. So let's get into these three steps that folks can take to improve this because of these situations that we're talking about. The first is to remove confusion about your brand by answering strategic business questions. Can you tell us a little bit about what marketing teams and organizations as a whole can do better here, Garrett? Yeah. So it's kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning about, you know, a brand is who you are at your core. And it's what you do and it's how you behave. And a lot of times I think people get into trouble with design because they haven't answered those core questions that are really just core strategic business questions that help them solidify their brand. So they don't, because they haven't answered those things, they don't really have a yardstick to measure the design against anything. It's just, well, does this look good? It's not necessarily, well, does this fit with these the answers to some of these questions, these core business questions that, that we've answered? So to build on that a little bit more, one example that I really love is there's a book by a guy named Patrick Lencioni, and it's called The Advantage. And one of the things I love about that book is he outlines six strategic business questions that organizations need to align behind, especially leadership teams. Um, we've, we've used this here internally, and it's, it's helped a ton for bringing alignment across the team, but also alignment to our brand, and then it helps us create that yardstick for the, that visual expression of our brand, some of the design. So the six questions that he mentions in that book, the first is, why do we exist as an organization? The second is, how do we behave? The third is, what do we do? What do we do as a company? Fourth is, how will we succeed? Fifth is, what is most important right now? And the sixth is, who must do what? I especially like the first three of why do we exist? How do we behave? What do we do when it comes to solidifying your brand? And those seem like such simple questions, but it's it's pretty staggering sometimes if you if you were to just go ask across the organization different people to answer those questions, the the very different answers that you get. So when you can bring alignment behind some of those core questions that help bring definition to your brand, it helps to have you know kind of that yardstick of measuring great design. And it removes that confusion to help you build a stronger, more consistent brand. Does that make sense? Oh, it makes total sense. I love what you said there about if you don't have that yardstick, then it's, uh, does this look good to you? And then it just becomes subjective. And, you know, I heard Dave Gearhart at Drift say something the other day when he was talking about kind of limiting the number of uh, inputs on your marketing decisions. When you open it up to everyone, you know, everyone's got an opinion on marketing because it's so public facing and everybody, like you said, can understand good design or, or not. And, you know, it, having something to go back to other than just, does this look good? Uh, the question is, does this does this align? And what you're recommending there about Patrick Lencioni's book, The Advantage, I can't recommend that enough to, to folks. So I'll make sure that we put a link to that in the show notes because it was some of the, the chapters of that book that were very uh, informative for us, Garrett, last year at a, as a team here at Sweetfish, we went through and and modified our core values. We kind of we had seven. We felt like that was too much. It's too many for people to remember. And we went through a process, and it took us 
two days in a leadership offsite. Again, you, as you mentioned, like who we are, how we behave, those seem like, oh yeah, kind of everybody understands that, but you can really, it might seem fluffy. And I can tell you going into that exercise ourselves as a team, it felt like, uh, are we really going to get value out of that? And I can tell you over the last year, we really took time to, to dig into those questions and everything comes back now to our three core values that we mentioned sometimes here on the show. And uh, it has given us that yardstick to go back to, not only from a design perspective, but in a lot of different things. So I completely agree with what you're saying there, man. So step one is removing confusion by answering these strategic business questions. You might want to check out the advantage from Patrick Lencioni for some help on how to do that. The second step is empowering creatives to define the visual expression of your brand. So if you understand what your brand is at the core, now it's about making sure that the visual representation is not just something that quote unquote looks good, but aligns to that brand that you've defined. Tell us a little bit about this step, Garrett. Yeah, I think this is a, this is especially an interesting one for us as marketers. You know, I'm you know I'm a marketer at my core, and we often we're close to the creative and the brand stuff, even though we might not be the experts. It might be someone on our team or someone we were closer with who really have that deep background in design or in brand. So we often have opinions on things, but they might not be necessarily well founded. And I think that it's hard sometimes to remove ourselves and let the designers, the creatives, be the experts that they are and go and define then the visual expression of the brand. As marketers and as leaders and executives, really when we try to meddle with that process, often we just get in the way. The thing that we really need to focus on is to define a really good creative brief, which is essentially just the answers to those strategic business questions, and then get out of the way and let the creatives go and do what they do best, be creative based on the feedback we've already given them through answering those strategic business questions. And they can develop you know, I found that when you when you kind of let them loose at that point, but have given them that that direction through answering those questions, they then develop awesome stuff that uh, probably wouldn't come about if you were kind of hovering over and and giving input at every step along the way. If that makes sense. Man, that makes total sense. I feel like I'm talking too much about Sweetfish here today, but you are just echoing so many things that we've been going through as a team. We recently promoted our lead designer on the team here at Sweetfish to a new role that our CEO, James, has been filling for a bit in creative director. And exactly that process that you're talking about when you have people at executive leadership that that understand where we're going and, and obviously the mission and our values are at their core, there are uh, things that they want to see in that visual expression, but then truly handing it over. And for anybody who didn't catch everything of what you said, you very clearly laid out some steps there and how the executive leadership team can hand over the pieces that need to be handed over to the design team with the proper direction. So I would suggest people hit that 15 or 30 second back button and replay what Garrett was saying here, because again, it's just echoing so much of what I see our team going through so I can hear the truth of it. This is not just fluffy stuff, guys. This is very tactical way for better design and branding. Garrett, I I love it, man. So we've got step one, removing confusion by answering those business questions, empowering creatives, which again, I love what you said there. And then third, be consistent. And you have some stats. I saw something you posted on LinkedIn a while back about uh, what marketers see in the correlation between consistent design and branding and improved ROI. Speak to us a little bit about that and then how folks can do this better. Yeah. So this last step is interesting because it sounds so simple, be consistent, but it's really like one of the most, the hardest, you know, most complex things of how do you actually execute that across a growing organization? So, you know, to mention some of those stats, there, there is a real value, a real business value to being consistent and building a consistent brand and having consistent design across everything that you do. Our team did a study recently where we talked to lots of marketers across all industries, B2B, B2C, all of it, and found similar results across, doesn't matter the type of industry or or, uh, type of business that you work in. Uh, One of the interesting stats from that was that uh, brands that present themselves consistently, marketers, senior marketing leaders estimate that if they were to always do that, they could see up to a 33% increase in revenue. And we've also found that Brands that present themselves consistently experience up to four times the visibility compared to brands that don't. 
in the markets that they serve. So there's, there's a real impact from doing this. It's a longer term game. It's not something that is just going to happen right overnight. Right. But there's, there's plenty of other studies out there. I mean, there's a, there's a really interesting study from McKinsey, uh, the consulting firm and uh, that they did just about a year ago that found that the financial return from some of these design centric brand focused companies is usually twice as high as those who aren't focused on building a strong brand or strong design. So again, I have a ton more stats I could share, but like those are some of the ones I found most interesting. And it really highlights this point that there is a real business reason for building strong design and a strong brand. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, on this show, we've talked a lot about, you know, pointing to Gary V in as an example of why quantity of content matters. And something that James and I were talking about the other day is, you know, if you follow Gary V and you watch some of his videos, what does he always have? There's that little, you know, pop or like uh, click sound that that sound that you identify with a Gary V video on social, and that is an example of that brand consistency. That you know, it's not going to. Leave to you know, fifty more leads tomorrow because you put a consistent sound at the end of uh, beginning of your social videos. But it is uh, something that adds up over time and over time. And so when you're putting out more content, the consistency of those elements, you know, uh, auditory, visual. And in every aspect of design, uh, it makes a big difference. And I think you've shared some some pretty compelling stats on that uh, today, Garrett. Man, this has been such a great conversation. Uh, I'm getting fired up because everything that you're saying aligns so much with what we've been experiencing. So I know that listeners are going to get value out of this. And for anyone who isn't directly connected with you, Garrett, if they want to reach out, ask some follow-up questions on this topic, or just follow along with you, because you brought so much value today, what's the best way for them? to reach out, man? Yeah, the best way is probably just via LinkedIn. So you can find me just Garrett Justice on LinkedIn. Um, would love to connect and answer any questions or continue the conversation with anyone who's interested. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for being on the show today. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, no problem. The last thing I mentioned, Logan, too, is, you know, I mentioned some of those stats that I shared from this study mm. on yeah. the impact of brand consistency. So if anyone's interested in that, too, I'm happy to send you a copy of that research that we've done. It's, it's, it's been pretty interesting. And, and, and as we continue to build on it and do more research into this space, uncovering some of those insights. Absolutely, man. I, lo- I love that offer uh, for folks who aren't connected with Garrett yet on LinkedIn. He and I just connected via LinkedIn a few weeks back before this interview. So I can tell you he's responsive. He'll get you uh, that deck he's talking about with some of that information. So reach out to him. We'll link to Garrett's LinkedIn profile in the show notes, make it very easy for people to reach out. Garrett, thanks again, man. This was such a fun conversation. Yeah. Thank you, Logan. It's, it's been great to be on the show. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.